Austin, thank you so much for an incredible weekend. I love your comedy scene down there. Vancouver, you are up next September 15th through the 17th. Edmonton, you're right after that September 29th through October 1st. Tickets to those shows and all shows are available on my website at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pants Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And again, every week, thank you. This channel, this community, everything continues to grow. And I can't thank you enough for your support. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Help us get those numbers up. It's a free way to help the show, right? And if you got to have more, then you got to check out the Patreon. The Patreon is the honeydew with y'all. I'm highlighting the lowlights with y'all. And these stories, I, just look at the comments. They're the wildest shit you'll ever hear in your life. It is $5 a month. There's no tiers. There's no level. It's 5 bucks a month. If you're in for a year... You get over a month free. You're getting a honeydew a day early ad free at no additional cost. If you or someone you know has that story that has to be heard, please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com, and hopefully we get to do an episode together. Now, that's the biz, guys. You guys know what we do over here. We're highlighting the lowlights. I always say to you, we're looking for a light in the darkness. These are the stories behind the storytellers. And ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to have this storyteller here today with us. For the first time here on The Do, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eddie Pepito. Welcome to The Honey Do, Eddie. Thank you, everybody. It feels really good to be here. I'm a storyteller. Uh, I, 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 you know, they say that storytellers aren't <laughs> happening anymore. Like we used to as a culture when we first started, right? And I'm talking about before the Greeks, you know, uh, we would just tell stories around a fire. And now people text, you know, they text each other and you really can't tell good stories, no. man. People need to get together more. Please get together more and tell each other's stories. Well, let's tell some today. But before we do, I don't want to get too far into it. Please promote plug everything okay. you would like. Uh, you know, folks, already you could tell I'm funny. Um, <laughs> EddiePepitone.com is the mothership. EddiePepitone.com, all my dates. I am going to be uh, in Chicago on the 15th at the Lincoln Lodge. I'm going to be at Good Nights in Raleigh on the 16th. I am going to be in Richmond, Virginia on the 17th. By the way, I only go one night. Okay, I'm in and out. I have the law on me. I have to keep moving, and I go by an alias, which is Eddie Pepitone. My real name is Melvin Schmudnick. Uh, I'll be at the Idiot, Bo Idiot Box the 19th. I'll be uh, Idiot Box the 20th. I'll be at Macon, Georgia, August 25th, Atlanta, Georgia, the 26th, and on and on. So uh, EddiePepitone.com, and you could see me there. And my social media, Instagram at Eddie Pep, Twitter at Eddie Pepitone, and that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. <laughs> um, Don't mention that name. All right. I, you're an interesting person. You're an interesting character. You're always the guy that you can count on to break the fucking tension in the room, to drop the jokes, to, to make people laugh. Never take it too seriously. I love that about you. Um <laughs> But I do want to get to know you better. So yeah. how old are you now, Eddie? 63. All right, you're 63. You know, I lie. I lie because of Hollywood. I'm really 79. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know, in Hollywood, you're supposed to, you know, lie. Like, say, like if you're 63, you're supposed to say, I'm 56, right? I could maybe get away. Maybe. But I lie up. Like I, I, when I meet with people and I pitch things, I go, I'm 79. <laughs> They're like, wow. You look good. Yeah. That's how you have to play this town. All right. Where, I feel so old though. 63. Yeah. Where are you originally from? Where are you born and raised? I was born in Brooklyn in a little town called Brooklyn. And um, 
<laughs> I was there for nine years, uh, and my dad finally bought us a house when I was nine years old, and we moved to the quote unquote country, Staten Island. Oh yeah, all the <laughs> way out there. Okay. Uh, which, you know, when I was a little kid, it did seem like the country because uh, Brooklyn was so congested and everybody's on top of each other, you know. And uh, in Staten Island, there were woods around me. We were one of the only houses on the block. Right now, my dad's house, he still lives in the same house, it, it is is just inundated with Hold assholes dad. my dad is 90 wow all right yeah he won't die which sucks because i get the house <laughs> when he dies dad if you're listening please die <laughs> i don't want to go you heard those dates who wants to go to greensboro you know what i mean you know what i mean and Ryan and and your audience, he it's like he's not even having fun anymore. You know what I mean? When you hit 90, you're basically being dragged around by helpers. Like, here, let's go here. And it's like, what kind of fun is that? You and know? your mom's gone. My mom did die. Yeah. She died during one of my sets. It, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't going well, and she couldn't take it. You know, I was getting heckled by my father. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, my, my mom did pass away, um, I think it was something like 15 years ago. Okay. And, and it was fucked up because she died alone, and I wanted to be with her, but I was watching the Giants, and they were driving. They were <laughs> driving. It was a playoff game. It was Green Bay, and I couldn't. They said, you got to get to the hospital right away. And I was like, the Giants are on the eight-yard line. The Giants are on the <laughs> eight-yard line. <laughs> All right, let's go back. Your parents you think I've alienated a lot of people already? Because I'm so dark about my family because it was painful. Well, that's what this show's all okay. about. That's exactly what it's about. So... Dad moves you guys out to Staten Island. Who's you guys? Are mom and dad still together at that time? Yes. And you yes. have siblings? Mom and dad and my sweet sister, Susan. Okay, just the two of you guys. Just the two of us. All right. You know? And who's older? I am three years older than my sister. All right. So at age, what did you say, by eight, nine, you guys moved nine, to Staten Island? I was nine, yeah. Yeah, and, and that then, was uh, what grade? I always go by grades. That was like yeah, that fourth. Be about, I was gonna say fourth grade. Fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. So what? Um, what's life like there? You say it was painful. What? What starts well, to happen? Well, this is gonna get a little heavy, but my mom uh, was bipolar, and this is before you know medication stuff. She had a electroshock, you know, she had, she was in and out of hospital. So it was dark. My dad was, you know, he was kind of a rageaholic, you know, and my mom was going in and out. Of so you can imagine, I just escaped into, man, I just escaped into two things, weed when I was 14 and just playing tons of sports. One thing Staten Island was good for, not good for many things. If you're a reader, don't go to Staten Island. People don't read books. They communicate by hitting each other with baseball bats. <laughs> but I would, I love hockey. And there was a, there was the woods and ponds and I would play hockey, you know, uh, and it was amazing. And my dad would play too. He was a good hockey player. Growing up, he played roller hockey in Brooklyn on the streets. Damn. But he was a good skater, too. But he tore his ligaments, I remember, knee ligaments while we were playing. And he was down for a long time, I remember. Was he? You're like, That's yeah. I was like, get up. It's 2-2. Two, two. You got to play defense, It's 2-2. Two, two. We're not stopping. <laughs> ligaments can be just ice it. No. So – yeah, okay, so, so back then, you're, you say your mom's bipolar. Was it diagnosed back then as mm -hmm. bipolar, and they just don't know what to do with it, so they're treating her with different uh, yeah. methods, medications, that yeah, sort of thing? Man. You said shock therapy was one of she the things? She had some electroshock, which I believe they still do. You know, I do it every time I try to plug in my toaster. <laughs> I have a fucked up We're toaster. We're never going to get <laughs> 
I have a fucked up toaster. <laughs> Folks, if you have a fu fucked up toaster, you may be able to heal yourself through electroshock. No, but yeah, and medications, but I don't think they were as good as the medications. Today. Of today. Course. What sort of relationship? Like gummy bears are terrific. What? what What sort of relationship did you have with her? Were you able to have one? Not really. You know, I loved her, of course, but it was, it was not great because my mom would go really bipolar like like hallucinations on the on the um manic end you know they called it manic depression back then okay and then on the depressed man she would she would be bedridden for for a long time like and i'd be pissed i'd be like i wanted fucking attention you know which is now why i seek it, you're getting a little sense of like why i'm a comedian because i didn't get that mom love so i'm all about like i want to be loved you know and that's why i drive a honda element it's a nine <laughs> it's a it's a two thousand. That's why I drive <laughs> By the way, shouldn't commercials be like that? Like you give a story about your mother having electroshock, <laughs> and it ends. That's why I drive a Honda Element. <laughs> oh, because God, there's man. room to weep in that car. It's boxy. It's good. <laughs> Oh my god! And what's your relationship like with your dad? Do you stay away from him? You say he's a rageaholic. Are you well, scared yeah. of him? My Are dad, you... I, I, you know, also, I mean, how do you not love your fucking family, right? But it's fraught with shit, and he is, he is a fucking pill. You know what I mean? He's ninety, and you're supposed to mellow at ninety, but he really, he really hasn't. And we still have things, you know. He's become a lot more supportive of me. When I first told my dad that I was going into comedy, he wanted me to be a doctor, you know? And I was like, I remember walking into the bedroom and saying to him, Dad, and I'll never forget, I'm, I'm going to study acting. I'm dropping out. of. I was going to Fordham University. I was trying to please him to be a, dent, school, a, be yeah, a dentist. Great school, a dentist. And my teeth, I should have been. Just <laughs> – just to get my own teeth worked on. I probably would have dentist friends. <laughs> I don't know if dentists can work on them. So imagine, <laughs> imagine me working on myself. And I'm talking to myself going, now, Eddie, you raise your hand when it hurts. Mm. But um, So you go to tell him, huh? I told him that I'm, I'm going to go into acting because I and, – and acting – you know, I love doing acting in Manhattan, and but every fucking scene that I did, people would laugh. Like, I'd be doing Death of a Salesman, and people would be laughing. So I knew comedy was my landing place, you know? And comedy was a way that I fucking got out my shit, you know? Like, uh, I would make my friends laugh insanely, and I was hooked from about, I think I started making my friends laugh, like, when I was when I moved to Staten Island, you know, because there was nothing really to do on Staten Island, you know, there still isn't. But I would, um, you know, we'd be standing around smoking pot, and I would just go into characters, and and they'd be like, "Oh, fuck it, he's funny," you know. I love that. So, at what point then do you head to the city to pursue this? Okay, and can I ask one more question? Sure. Sorry, Fordham is a good school. It's not cheap. Is Dad paying for this? Yes. And extra disappointed. Yes. All right. Yes, he didn't want to pay for it. You know, he was all about me getting grants, and I'm like, look, I don't know how to get a grant. <laughs> no, yeah. they're no, not easy. No, they're not. They had a little more money, I think, for students back then. But anyway, I I, I defaulted on my, my student loan year. They don't even go after me anymore because I just – when I get letters from banks, I just threaten them. Like I just say, I will drive around your bank – until you fucking let that loan go, you know? Because I'm good with Molotov. Well, anyway, <laughs> Molotov cocktails. Anyway, you go to my website, show you how to make them. Uh, <laughs> it's all on Eddie Pepitone. <laughs> the mothership. <laughs> the mothership. I like that. Uh, but yeah, so what was the question? The question is you moving to New York after you've told your dad. Is that the next step? You leaving 
Fordham and going to Manhattan to pursue comedy and acting? Yes, yes. Uh, I went to school. I always was still a city kid, thank God, because Staten Island was seriously like deliverance back then. It's more hip now, I think. But back then, man, it was like, you know what I mean? It was very uh, rural kind of. And um, so I went to Brooklyn Tech High School. And Brooke, so I would travel. I was traveling like a coal miner when I was 14. I lived right next door to a high school, Tottenville. But instead, my father wanted me to go to Brooklyn Tech. First of all, I'm not a tech, tech person. In chemistry lab, I would just fuck up experiments. Like I was terrible, but I traveled. I would get up. It would be dark. I'd be going to Brooklyn Tech. Um, but that kept me in the city because I was going through Manhattan to get mm -hmm. to Brooklyn. And I always hung out there. You know what? And, and a lot of times I would just hang in the village. Uh, Washington Square Park, Park became my favorite place. I would smoke weed and listen to musicians. I, and there was a comic. I don't know if you remember this guy. Black comic named Charlie Barnett, who used to perform, you know, in Washington Square. And he was good, man. That name does sound familiar. Yeah. I can't say, I, yeah. He actually was on SNL for a heartbeat. And I forget what happened, but Charlie was great and died of AIDS back then. But, um, you know, so I, I was a Manhattan guy, uh, Brooklyn guy, even though I lived in Staten Island. And then I started studying acting, yeah, in, in Manhattan. And I, my, my, w one of my first apartments was near the ferry. Like I, I, I moved out in steps and it was my first apartment. And this is one of the stories I yeah. want to tell you. So my first apartment, the only thing I can afford, you know, was a room with a shared bathroom. The Jack and Jill bathroom. Is that what they call it? Yeah, oh, I learned okay. on this show because I had one too in a place and you I didn't did? know what it was called. Yeah. I don't even like Never that. Never even saw the dude on the other side. Okay. So this place, yeah, I had a room and there was upstairs and there was a room up there. And the guy who lived upstairs, I never saw him, but I heard him. He was like the fucking joker. He was, I come to realize, a meth addict back then. You know, that mm -hmm. was like 19, what? 76, something like that, 78, the fucking guy would, yeah, he would just be upset. I would hear him running, giggling, and I'd be in my little room. I had a hot plate, you know, I had a hot plate and I would be like making just the worst kind of fucking food and I'd be getting high and I'd hear this lunatic and I remember I, I, I had a, this was wild. I had this girlfriend who was, who was actually, my friend had just broke up with this girl and he was furious at me that I was dating her, but I, I didn't care. She was very pretty and, um, you know, she would be, she was in my room one time and we're getting it on and I hear this guy up. He must hear it. The, the walls were not good. And he would, he heard us getting it on and he was like, the fucking, like it was <laughs> insane. And to my girlfriend's credit at the time, she was, she kept going, you know, she was like hearing this lunatic. I mean, he was a lunatic, but not only that, but her boyfriend was stalking me for a bit and he knew I was with her. At that time, and he was knocking. I got the guy upstairs screaming hilarious. And this guy, his name was Spencer. I don't remember his last name. Spencer, if you're listening, nothing ever happened. <laughs> we, yes, we had oral sex, Spencer, but how great is how, you know, anyway, it was never intercourse. Um, but um, this, he was knocking at the window. The window. My window, my front window, he was knocking at it and she knew it was him. And she was like, she just froze up and I froze up too. I didn't want to deal with this fucking guy. He scared me. He was older, you know, and I got this lunatic 
upstairs and him him knocking on the window and he finally went away and we did that thing where we just we just played dead for a long time you know <laughs> but that apartment was so fucking nuts i remember when i had to leave i had mice in that apartment mm -hmm. mice and i'll never forget and of course i was always i was always stoned back then i'll never forget um one point I was at the I was just sitting on my bed and I looked down and me and this mouse <laughs> made eye contact. You had a moment with the mouse. I had a moment with the mouse and the mouse, I guess, saw me, you know, as when the mouse saw me, it jumped straight in the air to eye level. And I said, I have to get out of this place. <laughs> The meth addict <laughs> getting stalked. <laughs> oh, this is little mouse coming up. All right. and, I, and I got an apartment in Queens, finally. So we talked before <laughs> the show about you said you suffer. Do you still suffer? But I, you did panic attacks. I, I'm on medication that really helps it. Uh, Zoloft okay. is designed to it's designed for hit, that. hit anxiety. So you know? go back to when this first oh, man, started. Dude. When did you and how did you even know what it was? Are you and I also didn't know what the are you fuck? freaking out like? Oh my god, I have my mom's shit. Yes, you know. Yes, yes, that was definitely it. I was like, holy shit. So what age does this sort of hit you? About fifty nine. No. Uh, <laughs> No, this <laughs> shit, this shit was so fucking scary. Oh. I would say I was in my 20s about, I can't, I, I, are you good with dates? Like when yeah, this happened and this happened? You know what's funny? Not my very... past, yes, last few years, especially, <laughs> no, no. I'm well, like, when did that the weed out? has gotten better. Yeah, it has. It has. <laughs> um, so I would say in my 20s, and it was like it first started manifesting. Like I would just – I'd just be like this. I'd be like, oh, boy. I, I, it would come over me, man, like so scary. It would feel like a shroud or another being kind of taking over your body like and it would be in my chest it would just be it really was kind of a monster like now i'm able able to visualize it back then i just felt it in my throat in my chest and what would happen is that i'd be you know it, i in particular places, it would manifest. And I realized it was some kind of claustrophobia at first. Like I'd be on a subway, a New York City subway, scary enough, right? But then I'd be on the subway and all of a sudden, I'd be like, I'd start to get nervous. And that nervousness went to a level where I was just like, oh my God, I, I can't... Uh, I can't breathe. And I would do shit like um, I would turn to the person next to me. Who, On the subway. Check this out. I would go, could you talk? I would go, can you talk to me for a second? I'm having trouble. And that person, whether a man or a woman, would just get up and leave. <laughs> They wouldn't even say a fucking word. And I even did it on the street to somebody. I was having a panic attack on a street. And I remember that one was brought on. It'd be sometimes it'd be brought on by partying too much. Like, like I'd just be shaky from a night out. <laughs> and I remember I was walking on the streets of Manhattan and I turned to a woman. And I go, can, can you uh, just talk to me for like a, you know, a minute I'm having. And she, I never, I'll remember just the way she backed away. You know, I was like, wow, people get scared when you say stuff like that, like out of the box. Like, can you just talk to me? I need help. That's kind of, yeah. that's kind of a, that's kind of a horror movie thing. Can you just talk or really say, I mean, if it's said and in quiet a- quiet too. And if you, slow. It's quiet. <laughs> yeah. 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 If it's said in a diner, it's it's sad. Yeah. If it's said <laughs> in the subway, <laughs> in the <scared>. subway, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Though. I'll never forget. <laughs> 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 
so true. I'll never forget too how the panic attacks would manifest. I remember one time I was bike messengering in Manhattan. I want to hear about this. Well, yeah. that was a crazy period for me too because just picture bike messengering like down fifth fucking avenue seventh avenue it's just so crowded so insane and back then there were tons of bike messengers on the streets there were no bike lanes i don't think yet or maybe there were had the whole was it quicksilver with kevin bacon i think it was they had a whole movie about it it so very (laughs) I was up for, you know, because I was hot back yeah, then. Yeah. I, I had, I was exercising like crazy. You know, I had a lot of work done back then. It is fallen now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the dermatologist told me this will last you, you know, up until you're 61. <laughs> no, but I remember one time delivering, I would go, it was hilarious because I was the work by, worst bike messenger in the world, meaning I would do I would do a couple of runs. You were supposed to work like they would want to get you to work from like nine to like six at night. And if they sent me into the village, I would just end it. the day. <laughs> I'd be like, that's it for me. And I just wind up in Washington Square Park hanging out with musicians or whatever. And I didn't care about money. I was like, who gives a fuck? You know, our first sponsor is Prize Picks. For kickoff, I've got Josh Allen throwing for more than 250 yards. I got my man Lamar Jackson rushing for more than 75 yards. And Cooper Cup is going to score more than 0.5 touchdowns. Prize Picks format is simple, it's easy to understand. So even if you aren't a football fanatic, you can still play. You pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. And there are projections for any sport you watch. NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and more. It's out there worldwide. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. They're safe and fast withdrawal and currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code HONEYDO. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize picks will give you 50. Don't forget to enter the promo code HONEYDOO at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Lately, I've been listening to a lot of Two Bears, One Cave, and Where My Mom's At, and it's been awesome. One reason it's been so awesome, because I use my Raycon wireless earbuds to do it. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and and sound better than ever. With optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge, trust me. Raycons give you eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. Raycons are priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. Let me say this. I use the other brands, and I use my Raycons all the time. And I'm telling you, the Raycons are money. You can take calls on them. The, The conversations are super clear. Um, I've had no problems with them. I'm just telling you they're fantastic, especially on places like a loud plane or something. I have no problem hearing or listening to anything that I want to hear. All right. So go to buyraycon.com slash honeydude today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash honeydew to score 15% off. Buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Guys, Babel is back and I couldn't be more excited. You know, Spanish, I've talked about it here. I'm taking Spanish, and it's something I wish I took more. I took it in, like, eighth grade, and then ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and I I struggled with English. There was no way. I got a D in Spanish, like one of my only Ds in high school ever. So if you're like me, and there's a foreign language that you regret not learning in school, it's never too late to start with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language off your list. I told you I'm taking Spanish, and the way they do it, they break it down. You're going to 
read it. You're going to hear it. You're going to also repeat it back. All right. You got to sit there and work on your accent and everything. And Babbel is great about that. All right. You only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson. So you can start having real life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and your accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, video stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash honeydew. That's babbel.com slash honeydew for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Now, Let's get back to the do. But anyway, I remember I would go into these corporations in Midtown Manhattan, you know, just looking like shit, you know, and, and, and these people were so well dressed to be going to law firms, you know, whatever in Manhattan, you know, the big shit corporate stuff. And I remember one time I started getting a panicky thing and I went into their bathroom. I said, can I use your bathroom? And they gave me their key and, you know, there's a couple of execs in there. And I started getting hives. That's another way panic or anxiety can manifest. I had these you and I'm I'm like, I get paranoid if I see anything on my body, mm-hmm. you know, whether I see a little black mark, you know, on my body. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Or if I just see, you know, uh, someone who works in sales on my body, whoever. <laughs> <laughs> but these were huge welts, hives. I don't know if you've ever had them. Mm-hmm. Not from anxiety, though. W- w- oh, like getting bit by yeah, something? A bite, a rash, something like that. But I, right. know, this I used to have a friend from- of mine that would throw up all the time before games, <laughs> and he would break out. Like It would look almost like freckles across his face. The hives would come out across his face, and he had to go to the sideline for a minute, and then he'd come back out every game. Oh, my God. Yeah. I learned that the way to get rid of it were antihistamines. Oh, yeah. It would fucking get rid of it like that, the hives. And I had to go because that's when AIDS was just first happening. And one of the symptoms of AIDS was hives. So I remember I, I had to go to the doctor. Now, I had never had sex with a man. I was always rebuffed. So, <laughs> you know, I would plead, you know. I couldn't even get a glory hole thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? The, <laughs> they peek through the glory like, nah. hole. They were like, <laughs> "No, thank you!" Like they would just yell through the plywood or the plexiglass. Oh, they would man. be, "No, thank you," and I'd be like, "Please, somebody touch me!" Anyway, <laughs> just hug my dick. <laughs> just hug my. Dick. Just hug it, guys. <laughs> hug my dick. <laughs> uh, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I had to. Get, I I was scared. My doctor was like, "Oh, this is a symptom of AIDS," and he worked in Chelsea, where he was dealing with a lot of AIDS. And so I, I didn't have it, obviously, but it was scary. I I just went through this whole period. I would say it lasted these, and you never knew. I never knew when they would okay, come so I was on. Gonna say they were unpredictable. You were like, "Oh, this is going to happen now." I didn't get on a subway for a while. I or an elevator. All of a sudden, I couldn't take elevators. And to me, that meant claustrophobia. Like, mm-hmm. like elevator, can't get out. Subway, I would, you know when I would start to panic on a subway? Um, when the subways would stop in between stations and say, there's another train ahead of us. There's a little delay. And I would be like, oh, oh, okay. You know, and it would slowly come on. Will you, is there anybody to talk with? <laughs> There, you'd have the whole car to yourself. <laughs> you hey, what about? And I'd start conversation like, "What about the weather, huh? This system doesn't seem like it's going to move." <laughs> the system. <laughs> um, how were you on flights? That's even smaller than a subway. Um, yeah, I I don't think I flew that much back ben. then. I would be driving. 
you know, like I would just drive. But you can open a window in a car. You could feel better, shit like that. You, you would had drive control. I think it was the lack of control. I feel and that. And the trapped element, like, ah, oh, it was scary, So man. how did you start to work on it and beat it? Well, I was in therapy and I, and I wasn't on any medication. Okay. And finally, my shrink was like, you know what, Eddie, you have suffered enough with this. Because I didn't want to go on medication because my mom was always on medications. And back then, I was like, nah, medications are going to numb you. You know, I won't be as funny, blah, blah, blah. I, I was same worried, same worry. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to lose myself. Is this going to change who I am? Like, <laughs> God <yeah>. forbid. <laughs> I'm such, I'm Can so make well. Me funnier? <laughs> I'm so well put together <laughs> if I'm not on a train or an elevator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so she put me with a psychiatrist. She referred me to a psychiatrist, the, the dispenser of the meds, and they put me on a combination. Back then it was Prozac mm -hmm. and um, Clonopin. And I'll tell you, mm. the Clonopin really knocked out that anxiety did it uh, oh yeah and not only that but it's very addictive you know and i i got off clonopin because i was always like i was always like doing this shit like i wasn't anxious but i'd be but the clonopin was such a nice mellow feeling that i would go i think i am a little anxious <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be but i'd be yeah, convincing yeah. myself <laughs> you know i probably could use a half and so that was a slippery slope, you know what I mean? But you're able to beat, you fly now, you'd ever, you're good oh. on all this stuff. Do you ever have panic attacks anymore? You know what? They are rare. Good. They are very rare, and I realize when I'm susceptible to them, and that is when I'm extremely tired. When I am tired and haven't slept, stressed about work, like getting to gigs, you know, plan an early, early flight, I have to be be careful because an early flight, like if I have to go to LAX, and every plane out of LAX feels like the last plane out of Saigon to me, which is <laughs> yeah. which is why I like the Burbank Airport. Yeah. I don't know if you know the Burbank. Airport. Oh, it yeah, is I so it. sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like going to Andy Griffith's Mayberry Town. Hi there, Bob. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, TSA pre helps so much. All pre over. and clear. I'm on both of you are. I zip yeah. through that shit if they have it. Yeah, yeah. I never did the clear thing. I don't. But the TSA pre is amazing. And uh, I usually don't tell anybody about it because it's fucking great. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anybody else getting it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay now, but I have to be careful, man, if I haven't slept, you know. But, you know, I realized, too, that all of this anxiety that I was experiencing then was this accumulation yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, this accumulation of, I don't know, self-loathing, like unexpressed feelings, uh, you know, like, you know, being traumatized by my dad's rage, by, you know, my mom's depression, that kind of thing. And I never really got it out. And I think what happened is that it, turned on me like uh all of this stuff turned on me and i think when i really started doing my comedy and committing i started living my own life like i was kind of living for my dad and what he and i still have this problem of trying to please every fucking body around me. people pleaser yeah yeah, I think a lot of comics have that. Mm -hmm. um, and now I kind of go the other way where I just insult audiences. <laughs> but it's yeah, done in yeah. a fucking funny, you know, hopefully yeah. a funny way where I'm go where I say, I don't respect you people. I just did 30 minutes and it was easy. <laughs> I thought there would be pushback in Lincoln, <laughs> Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> You're soft. So uh, I think it really had a lot to do with me living an inauthentic life, like trying to please fucking everybody. I had no idea who I was. And one of the ways this fucking anxiety manifested, I would check this out. This was scary. I would look in a mirror 
And I would not, and I'm being serious, recognize who I was looking at. And I'd have to run out of the fucking mirror, run away from the mirror because I didn't know who I, it was like a literal, you know, I didn't know who I was. And now I can't get enough of myself in a mirror. <laughs> you ever look into your eyes and want to fuck yourself? Like, <laughs> I and I have beautiful eyes, I have blue eyes, and I and I lose myself. I lose myself in my eyes now in a mirror, and I just jerk off. I, I, <laughs> I jerk off, and the fantasy is me taking me out to dinner, <clears throat> fucking me in the bathroom. I would imagine also beyond fucking in the bathroom uh, <laughs> that now too, if these panic attacks do come on, you know what's going on. It's not a foreign feeling to you. Like that very first few times, oh. like, what the fuck is this? Now you've got education, medication. That's still medication. scary, though. I imagine, I, I'm saying at least the the unknown is not there about it anymore. Right. You're like, is this a right. heart attack? Am I, what am I having? You, you know, know what, what though, this? about that? Because I, I, I'd always thought I would die, you know? From, but, from the feeling of that? Like yes. it, would, it would kill you? Yes. Yes. And and the doctors talk about this shit. It, it mirrors heart attacks, you know, but it's not, you know, and a lot of people go to emergency rooms, which I did a couple of times, just wander into an emergency room in Manhattan, you know, and, uh, you know, $600 later being told, yeah, you're fine. They would give me an anti-anxiety thing. And now I carry around a set of Klonopin, it's called Ativan, mm -hmm. which is, I tell you, as far as a drug... Uh, that mellows you. It's not like clonopin, which was a beautiful, nice trip. This is more like, yeah, the anxiety has gone, but I don't feel like doing anything with it. <laughs> you clonopin, know? you would? Yeah. Yeah. Clonopin, I would be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah. sort of like, I'm glad I had a panic attack. It would be wild with clonopin, you, you know, because you would go from this intense panic to this incredible relaxation and you you almost look back at the panic attack and go what the fuck happened there you know like why you know because it's two such uh disparate frames of mind it's mm -hmm. like so different you know and 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 it's amazing it just makes me think how we we are brain chemistry it, i mean it's amazing how pills just change well, your i'm sitting here thinking about it because i was so against pills for so long too medication medication i'm already on cholesterol blood pressure you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i go to the doctor every six months you i do. get my i do yeah. i get a full lipid panel urine all that shit done uh, you don't so have make to brag sure about not, urine <laughs> make sure it's not fucking with my kidneys you know because yeah. they found out a lot of roundup in my urine <laughs> I just saw that. I, I saw just that. saw that today. I'm like, motherfuckers. Round them. Round in our up. goddamn piss. <laughs> so I'm going to just hire myself out as a crop duster. Piss from Strap a plane. Strap you underneath <laughs> and just piss from <laughs> Strap <laughs> underneath the plane. Just and drink just the water and piss right. all over. <laughs> Beer and water. That would be a hell of a job. <laughs> But I did. I started taking it was during the pandemic when they told us we oh. had to homeschool my kid. You know, my kid wasn't a teenager. My my Ooh. daughter, my stepson mm -hmm. was. He's fine. My daughter's five. She's just learned how to read. So I'm sitting there with her and yeah. we're doing these lessons together. And I'm I can't. What are you talking about? I'm stuck in this box now, and and my job, my creative outlet, the only thing that has saved me from all this bullshit over these years, now we can't even do. Stand up's gone. Yeah. So it was and fuck Zoom stand up. Yeah. That was a drag. I never did it, and it was lean into this, and I got on some medication. I started taking because Christina P. She's told me ten milligrams of Lexapro, and it worked for her. I'm not a drinker, so I don't have to worry about mixing it with alcohol or anything Good. like that. Good, um, because I know there's problems with that kind of stuff. But right, um, right. It's, so just it helped, uh, so I was, ten milligrams and you're good. Yeah, it's helped. I mean, I it's don't helped, know. Yeah. I don't know what twenty would do. You know what I mean? I've only tried ten, but I um I was very uh, you know that machismo way of uh, a lot of guys like I don't need therapy. Totally. So I was all about therapy and all Me about too. mental health, but it was something about the mm -hmm. pill. I know that felt like you I feel was like cheating. Yeah, or, or, or I'm not a man. Right. 
Right. You know. Yeah. I need this crutch to. to I. I'm not a complete uh-huh. person. I. And then yeah. I. And then I started taking that pill. I was like, "Fuck that dumb way of thinking. <laughs> I don't have anxiety about that anymore." That's right. Yeah. And and you realize it doesn't take away your creativity at all. And I'm know? so glad you said that because that's the first thing I thought: Is this going to yeah. change my fiber? Is this yeah. going to change who I am? And it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. All. It just kind of takes the edge off. Yeah. It just yeah. kind of levels you to a point. Um, and I'm not saying take Lexapro. I mean, every no, every person's no, chemical makeup. No, you consult your goddamn doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's chemical makeup is different. It was so off work for you. It might be the worst thing for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Consult your goddamn doctor. No, I can get you Zoloft. <laughs> <It's> co- <laughs> so you meet me at a 7-Eleven in the Valley. All right? <laughs> no, um... <laughs> I wanted to say about the milligrams, my doctor started me on 50 milligrams of Zoloft. I'm on 200 now. (laughs) All right. And and that's the level that works for me. And I remember I, what I do is uh, I have a joke where I go, I'm on 200 to the crowd. I go, I'm on 200 milligrams of Zoloft and it does nothing for me. I just like the taste. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I crush it in a mortar and pestle and I pour it on cereal and I watch porn muted. I don't even masturbate. I just eat my Zola. No. <laughs> Actually, one of the shows I did, I, there was a nurse in the audience and I said, I'm on 200 milligrams of Zoloft. And she went, Jesus. <laughs> and... And I said, what? And I found that she's a nurse. I go, really? Is that high? She goes, yes. And I go, well, that's what my shrink wants me on. I got mad at her. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. I want to shift gears to this other story because I, you have Mm -hmm. a very interesting story about a relationship. You may have talked about this way back when on your Crab Feast episode. I, I don't know. I don't. Maybe. But I want to hear this. So when at the well, age of 20, mm-hmm. you dated a woman who was? Yeah. Uh, 40. 40. 20 years, your senior. You now, she seduced me. I mean, I was a nervous kid, you know. Um, had you I, lost your virginity or is this your virginity to this woman? Uh, shit. I, th- I had lost it, but then I found it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that. <laughs> Found it again for another five years, so I lost it again. Actually, I think she was the first person really that I actually had intercourse with. Yeah. Uh, because now, I, real quick, you're 20. How old your mom at the time? Well, you're 20. My mom was 18. I was 20. <laughs> it was the weirdest fucking. I she had the aging disease where she was going Backwards. backwards. No, uh, my mom. How old was your mom when she had you? Yeah, that's a good fucking question. Um, I think she was like 21. So this woman's about the age of your mom. So you figure it out. Anyway, we go. But I was very attracted to her. She was a history teacher. Um, And where? At college? Yes. High school? College. At Fordham? No, it was, uh, I had dropped out of Fordham and went to the College of Staten Island, which actually had great professors from Manhattan. She was great. Total intellectual. And I was always into leftist politics. I loved Karl Marx, Das Kapital, all this shit. And she was an activist and attractive. And I'd just be in the class like, oh my my God. And uh, I would go up to her after class and say things like, "Um, you know, I'm having trouble understanding the feudal system, you know. And one time I asked her a question like that after class and she said, well, because I didn't know she was into me either. She goes, well, why don't you come over my apartment and we'll go over it. (laughs) And I'm so naive that I thought this is very nice of her. (laughs) Really? You were really thinking that? You weren't thinking I'm going to get laid? No. Okay. So I go to her apartment in Greenwich Village and to me, it was the coolest fucking thing in the world you know and um we're sitting we're laying on her rug reading das capital what's she wearing <laughs> she was just dressed normal she wasn't, yeah there wasn't so anything. when you got there there still wasn't an indication for you like right oh, she shit, was being cool okay 
And, uh, but she turns to me as we're reading this and she goes, do you smoke pot? And I'm like, yes. And as soon as I got high, I, we just started kissing. And so it, it was on from there. It was on from there. But what was really hard for me, like I was ecstatic because I was like, I can't believe that this woman likes me, was that she spoke six languages, was so experienced in different affairs around the world. I was so in love with her that I was like the little girl in the relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got the cheat code. <laughs> I'd be like, what do, you, what do you mean we can't hold hands on campus? Like she was like, oh, don't yeah. hold, don't fucking do that on campus, you know? And I'd be like, why? I was, you know, I was just like clingy. And not only that, but then we would hang out with some of her friends who were, the, these people all had PhDs, all spoke different languages, and they would be talking about shit so far over my head, you know, the you know, the revolution in Yugoslavia, uh, you know, this artist, that artist. And they turned to me, Eddie, what do you think? And I'd be like, well, the Yankees are having a good year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got nothing, guys. Oh, dude, it made me, I was always into reading books and shit. I was always kind of geared toward being an intellectual sort of and it made me like read all the i got exposed to a lot of good shit but it was so painful not being able to socialize with these people and i felt like i was a object in a museum to them mm -hmm. they'd be like hmm i think he'll be an art i remember one of them said i think he'll be an artist like and i'm just going ah. <laughs> just this <laughs> piece of clay sitting over there yeah waiting to be molded yeah but uh, yeah, I was with her on and off. I was going to ask how long? Six years. Wow. On six and off, years. man. Yeah, for six years, uh, it was it was it was it was fraught. It was my first, and I, I mean, you can imagine coming from you know my background. I was just like jealous. You know, she had an ex who was kind of in the picture, and she also had a little daughter. Uh, who was so fucking sweet, and I would tell her story. I don't know if you do this with your daughter, but I would I would make up stories. I would go, okay, her name is Sasha. Her name is Sasha. And I would go, okay. So there was this girl. Her name was Sasha, and she would just light up, right? I forget how old she was, then three, four. And uh, I would tell this story about her, and then at the end of the story, she would go, do it again. Yeah. Do, do you... Yeah, and then I'm like, fuck. I, <laughs> I can't remember what I said. I just told you a made up five minute story. Yeah. You, you yeah. had, yeah, do it mm -hmm. again. And I would just tell so, another story, you know? And by the third story, I'd be like, look, I have shit to do. No. <laughs> you all right. You get your ass to bed. <laughs> what a sweet kid, though. But I fought with Manuela a lot. Her name is Manuela. Uh, she died <laughs> recently. She which, really did? Yeah. Oh, man. What happened? Uh, she had like, like a terrible gastro in uh, something or other, you know, I didn't really, I hadn't been in contact with her a lot. We, we did see each other. Now she's 20 years older, right? We saw each other a few years back and then I, and I was looking at her going, she doesn't look that great at 77 because I was thinking of hitting it again. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, you know, I'm not doing, because we were hiking she was a big hiker, you know, and I was thinking of driving her into the bushes. <laughs> but you breaking know. her fucking hips. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you take from that relationship? It's a twenty. It's a woman who's twenty years older than you. You know, do you have you ever dated uh, an age gap like that again? No, no. No, no. You're married, right? I am married, yeah. How um, long have you been married? I've been married 10 years, and before that we dated seven. So it's a long time. It's a long time. Yeah. My wife is like 10 years younger than me, you know, which in Hollywood isn't cool. You should be dating someone 30 years yeah. younger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm available. No. Uh, mm. 
but I never, I never did, you know. It would be funny if I, if I still had the older lady thing and like I'm 63 and I always, and I would just cruise nursing homes, like looking for an 83 year old. They would love some Eddie Pepitone, bro. How you doing? Did you, did you, did you watch my special like I told you? <laughs> you like I, I told you. <laughs> I don't understand your anger. <laughs> Come on. Society's falling apart. <clears throat> <laughs> um, do you have any kids? No. No, I knew not to have children. Why? Because I was, uh, first of all, and, and I really kind of applaud the comics, and there's a lot of them who bring up kids. And to me, that's a huge financial uh, stress, you know, because what we do, I think, is very fucking... Uh, it's not that reliable. It's scary. It's it, fucking Hollywood and uh, performing, you know, the income. I didn't really start making money in this business until I was like 40 something. You know what I That's mean? That's when you start to see a change is in your 40s. It really is. Yeah. It's great. It's a long fucking time to be. Most people give it up. Yeah. By then. They're or like, die. <laughs> or yeah, die. Or die. They usually blow their brains out <laughs> in a hotel in Greensboro. <laughs> <laughs> when are you there again? <laughs> what are the ticket sales? You're fucking kidding me. They've sold eight tickets? <laughs> but. um. Yeah, so so it was a conscious well, decision a con versus not uh, being able to. <laughs> well, you know, it was it was conscious and also my background. I I I just had so much anxiety. You know, I'm sure everybody has this about bringing the kid up wrong. You know, and I'm a and especially now with what's going on now in our world, and especially in this country with guns. I mean, you tell me, I mean, I wouldn't be, I would be so overprotective. I'm so like codependent that if I had a little kid, a girl, you have a girl? Yeah, a little girl. Now, what do you, you must work, do you, or you can't. I, I do. Imagine. Yeah. You can't, I mean, a good parent will forever. You know, your your job as a parent doesn't stop, well, yours did, but your job, <laughs> mine did too, but yours, your job as a parent shouldn't stop. Let me say that, that doesn't, shouldn't stop. I brought up my parents. You know, yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, and 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 then the, and then the anxiety changes to all right. Now they're driving. All right. Well, now they live on their own. All right. Now they're married. All right. Now they have. You know what I mean? Like it's a it's a never ending cycle of introduct introducing new stress and anxiety. <laughs> yeah. So that Fuck. Lexapro ten might be getting up there. <laughs> you may have to check that up a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have nieces, nephews? Do you have any? You do? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nephews, nieces. Uh, that's cousins, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cousins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we were kind of a tight knit group when we were living in Brooklyn, you know, and I used to hang out with, with – um, you know, my cousins all the time and we would hang and stuff. But then we all moved. They moved to Long Island, which my father would say, fucking Ambie has to move to Long Island. It's an hour and a half to get there. He hated it. My 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 uncle Ambie moved to Shoreham, Long Island, which is where they built a nuclear power -uh. plant. <laughs> he, he lives next to a nuclear power. They shut it down, but. Not a good move, you yeah. know. But yeah, yeah. But I, I don't see them much anymore, you know. But it's funny because they see me, you know, doing the comedy thing, you know. Yeah. So you go for people who don't know you. Mm -hmm. You go. I mean, you've to just throw out some of your roles from old school. To, I mean, you've been in so well, many that films. Was a and great one. Well, the first thing that really kind of got me. I didn't have, you know, got me work a bunch was Conan. Mm -hmm. I knew one. Of, and this is how I've gotten most of my work, by the way. I know the writers on these fucking shows. And they're like, oh, Pepitone would be good. Because auditioning for things is not easy. And most fucking directors or shows have people they in mind. They, they yeah. know who they, they fucking want. And it ain't you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, but- I was 
I was, I, I waited a lot of tables in New York and I was the world's worst waiter. You know, I just, they, they, I, I, and, and I had friends who would get me jobs <coughs> and, and in high end restaurants and my shirt always had little chocolate spots on it from the desserts I would eat in the stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> I used to eat something called profiteroles, which are puff pastries with ice cream and chocolate syrup in this French. That sounds good. It's fucking delicious. And so I would, you know, I'd be <laughs> eating that shit in the stairwell, chocolate, and have to go to a table. I remember my manager, uh, she was a woman, and she just looked at me uh, when I was on the, uh, you know, waiting on a table with chocolate. And she couldn't help herself in front of customers. She's just looking at my shirt that was still freshly dripping because I had rent run out. And she goes, really? Really? And she fired me that that day, you know, and I became a barber for a while. No, I, I was never I was a barber. Say. How funny would that be? Uh, but yeah, my so first Conan. big thing, I got a call. I mean, I had been working here and there, but I got a call to be on Conan and it was a monologue uh, that they wanted me to do about being the guy who got passed over as the life serial kid. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. that was Mikey. Mikey, Mikey elite it. And this bit was, I, and I had to do this to the camera. I was grounded <laughs> when what. the life people were coming around. And I did it like that, you know? Coming I around. was grounded. This kid, Mikey, he sucked. I should have been a life kid. And I, it was a rant. And I ended it by uh, throwing the, box of life on the ground and stomping on it. And it was a huge moment for me because I was in front of a live audience in Rock Center, you know, where Conan, when he was in New York, used to tape. And he just kept using me. You know, I became, I don't know if you ever saw this, but I, <clears throat> for years on Conan, I would be the heckler mm -hmm. who would heckle him. And it was a great bit. Like I was really featured, you know. And then you hit films after that? I had some film work. It moved old school, the movie with Will Farrell, Vince Vaughn, Luke Wilson, who I became little buddies with at that point. Um, they, they, you know, I came to LA to film it. I had never been. And, uh, they is that right? Yeah, just coming out to do old school was the first time you'd even been to California. I've, never done comedy here before. Or no. Anything? Oh wow! No, 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 no. Hell no, yeah! No, no, no. And uh, they put me up in an apartment in Venice by the ocean, and I was like, "This is fucking great." And I had a manager who was based in LA, and she was like, "Look, you should come here. There's more work here." Like she was like you know, making the case for LA. And I said, you don't have to tell me twice because it just seems so nice. And I was in Venice and I was living with a model. She had a parakeet, beautiful situation. <laughs> and Until you old school. It, yeah. And then I did old school in it. And it was funny because we, the, the part I had, I was somebody they kidnapped. Will Farrell jumped out of a van. It's the Metallica scene. Is it? When they're playing Master Puppets. Isn't that you? They grab the van. Throw in the yes. Van. Yeah. Yes. And um, uh, so we were called the Pledges. And the other Pledges were Simon Helberg, who became a big star with Big Bang. And he does movies. Rob Cordroy, who, who became a fucking, uh, you know, he does tons of movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was on Comet. Uh, what was that show with Jon Stewart? Fuck. It's still going. Daily Show? Uh, Daily Show. Yeah. Rob became a correspondent and got big and that, them movies. Um, me, Cordry, Simon Helberg, this guy, Rick Gonzalez, who does a lot of shit. Really good dude. And um, anyway, it was really cool. Um, they cut a bunch of our stuff out, so we were kind of glorified extras, but it was a great experience. Like I got to see, because we were in so many scenes, I was filming a lot, and just watching Will Farrell work. You know, doing his comedy. Get paid to watch Will Ferrell work. Yeah. I mean, I was right there, you know, and I got to see him, like, do his thing up close. It was amazing. Yeah, it's an, I mean, it's an iconic fucking 
comedy I film. It's I still one of, get good residual. I wanted to ask you without without without. <laughs> Let me tell you something because it. it's it's picked up everywhere. It's on everywhere. It's now always it's streaming. playing a lot. Yeah, and people are emailing me going, "I didn't know you were in this movie." Blah, and you blah, still blah. get good residuals. That you know, good because it was how many years ago? Yeah. that fucking movie. It was like twenty early two thousands. Yeah, it was yeah. it was a while ago, and uh, I the first residual check I got they they're big when they start. And then they 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 peter out, right? The first residual I got was a check for seventeen grand. God, <laughs> and I was uh, like, uh, I thought I was rich. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah. I was I was like, baby, we have no worries. <laughs> of course, it was gone pretty quickly. Yeah, but I was right. like, it's over, baby. <laughs> it's over. The struggle <laughs> is over. <laughs> Uh, all right, I, we got to get you out of here. I got to right. get out of here. But I have a question to ask you. Your first time here, I was I gave you a heads up before. Now, after what we've talked about, your mm. growing up, your parents, your anxieties, panic attacks, what advice would you give to 16-year-old Eddie Pepitone? Oh, okay. I, okay, my advice to the 16-year-old me would be don't put so much pressure on yourself and live your life like don't try to live your father's life because he's fucking nuts and he's trying to live through you because he doesn't have a life you have to do your own thing and and basically i would say say to the 16 year old you're gonna be all right because I never thought I would be all right because I was always so fucking, fucking anxious, you know? It's like, you're going to be all right. Just do your own thing. You know, follow your own fucking path instead of trying to live someone else's path. Because if you follow your own path and you follow your, 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 your passion, you know, what you want to do, it will work out. It will. Now, in today's America, that's no longer true. <laughs> Because it's a fucking shit show. <laughs> it's a shit show. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. Again, please plug and promote well, everything. The thing I forgot to plug up top so, yes. is my podcast, uh, Apocalypse Soon. Apocalypse, <laughs> <laughs> which is again about the deterioration of everything in America and the world. But Apocalypse Soon, uh, it's on all things comedy. It's where you get all your podcasts. I also put it up on YouTube. Uh, so please check that out. All right, man. Thank you so much, Eddie Pepitone. Thank you. Um, and as always, RyanSickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We will talk to you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>